Our text for this morning's message is from Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 25. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. May God bless the reading of this word. In 1943, Betty Smith published her novel titled A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, in which she explored how an individual and a family can survive and even grow in the midst of overwhelming adversity. And this book was adapted as a movie directed by Elia Kazan in 1945. If you read the novel or saw the movie, you remember how the story follows the life of Frances, or Francie as she was called, a young girl living in Brooklyn with her parents. Their life together was hard. Her her good-hearted father is a weaver of dreams and fine words, but he has a drinking problem. Francie's mother, on the other hand, takes care of the practical matters in life. Mother is increasingly bound by the past and burdened by the harsh present. She was determined to deal in a clear-eyed manner with the harsh reality of their lives as they were living it from day to day. Francie's father dares to envision a different reality. He died one December while looking unsuccessfully for work. And many, many people attended father's funeral. And his widow was surprised at this tribute from the community. After all, father had not been a rich or a powerful man. But mother learned that he had made people feel joyful somehow because he had a way of lifting their vision above the hard and dirty pavement. In A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, Francie's father was the dreamer and her mother was the practical one. Mother looked into their future and saw only a repetition of today. Father, on the other hand, looked into the future and dreamed of a different reality. It would be fair to point out that father's dreams did not put bread on the family's table. But isn't it true that we need more than bread to make life worth living? Our text challenges us this morning on this very point. Where do we come down between these two choices? Are we on the side of dreams or merely the present hard reality? Do we dare to hope for the coming of God's reign into such a troubled world as ours? 
Listen again to verse 17 of our text this morning. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. I wonder whether we would really want such a situation, a whole new world, including a new spiritual reality. Wouldn't we be like people with amnesia if we did not remember our past? And yet, in our determination to be realistic, to let the past determine what is possible for our future, don't we become bound by the past, by our failures, but also by our successes. Trouble in the Middle East has become more intense since the October 7, 2023 terrorist attack on Israel by Hamas. And peace now seems farther away than ever in that part of the world. Over the years, we have watched peace talks off and on between Israel and its neighbors, between Arabs and Israelis, and now and again, some progress is made, but it is slow and difficult. The peoples of that region all live with a strong sense of the past. Every group involved has long historic ties to the land. Each group can point the finger at the other over past wrongs. But getting to a point where they can live together as neighbors in peace seems as unlikely as the words in verse 25 from our text this morning, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. If the people of the Middle East or Central Europe or Northern Ireland or different racial groups of the United States are to make any progress toward the vision of Isaiah, each group will have to envision a future that looks very different from their past. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. We know that it's easy to become bound by the past. Sometimes a bad student is quickly sized up at the beginning of the term and then finds it difficult to break out of the role of the so-called poor student. And when serious illness strikes a family member, that family often draws from past experiences with that illness in order to imagine what to expect in the days and weeks to come. And too often we even allow ourselves to be bound by our past successes. A business that finds a formula for success sticks with that business model. And then the business climate changes and that company is stuck still doing what it knows how to do best, but now it is failing instead of succeeding because the world has changed. A church, like a company, can become tied to the patterns of the past, to both the successes and the failures of days gone by. But the Christian faith is lived in a creative tension between remembering the past on the one hand and looking forward in hope to God's future on the other. Living in hope means living between looking back and looking forward, living somewhere between remembering and dreaming. The Old Testament book Ecclesiastes expresses the world-weary philosophy of the person who cannot dream. The person or group that has lost the ability to envision an alternative to what we experience today begins vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. That sentiment is often the best that we can make of life when times are tough. And life isn't going as we would like and we are left to figure things out for ourselves as best we can. 
But the good news of Isaiah and of the gospel message is that God breaks through our endless repetition of yesterdays to bring us a new tomorrow. In a few short weeks, we will enter the season of Advent, a time of year when we can adjust our hearts and our minds to receive good dreams from God. In fact, both Advent and Lent are the two seasons of attitude adjustment in the Christian year. Seasons when we can adjust to the possibility of something new from God breaking into our midst. Throughout the pages of the Bible, our creator points us to our good dreams. God gives us hints and visions of something new. The creator invites us to envision an alternative future for our world and for our families and for our church. Verse 17 of our text promises, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And then there follows that beautiful vision of an alternative future, a future where sorrow will not have the last word on life, a future in which life will be lived to the fullest, a future where the loose ends of this life will somehow be tied up and woven together by the creator, a future where former enemies will live together in peace and harmony a time when they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Those last three words are perhaps the most important words in our text this morning, says the Lord. If we believe them, then we can live out of the promise of an alternative future. Do we really believe that God said these things in Isaiah 65? Is it really the Lord who has given us this good dream concerning a different tomorrow? Or is it merely the wishful thinking of a poet who lived long ago and far away in a simpler place and time? Yes, any dreamer can dream, but if God has given the dream, then it is a promise. If God has given us the dream, then you and I can live out of the power of that promise. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former thing shall not be remembered or come to mind. In just about two weeks, we will be going to the polls to vote for president and for all the down ballot candidates Daily, my email inbox is full of appeals for more donations to the candidates. And in this superheated political climate, some have expressed an absolute sense of exhaustion. This week, I had a conversation with a neighbor who has a lawn sign in his yard supporting a presidential candidate for whom I don't intend to vote. But in that conversation with my neighbor, we did not talk about politics. We have been neighbors for over 20 years. I asked him questions about what is important in his life these days. And then I listened as this retired person told me about his progress towards a seminary degree. And he told me how his study is enriching his teaching at his church. And we did not discuss the lawn signs in the neighborhood, his or my other neighbors. I don't know about you, but right about now, I need a season of attitude adjustment to be able to receive that good dream, a promise of something better than today from God. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The good dream in Isaiah 65 is a picture of God's kingdom come to earth. And certainly we don't bring God's kingdom into being by our own efforts, but we are called to live our lives facing in God's direction. If we believe in that, says the Lord, then we can live out of the power of God's promises. And we can invest our lives and make things a little better here and now. 
then we can dare to do something to improve our world rather than nothing. Then we can envision ourselves and our loved ones and our church doing something different from what we have always done in the past. This is what it means to look forward to the coming reign of God. Many years ago, I was visiting in the hospital as a volunteer chaplain, and I went to see a very elderly woman on my list. We had never met, so I didn't know what to expect, but I greeted her with a smile, and I asked how she was feeling. But she responded with a string of words that made no sense. And I asked her if she knew where she was at that moment. And again, she spoke as though she were talking in her sleep. So I gently held her hand and spoke softly to her. I wondered if somehow I might touch the person within that worn out body. Would you like to pray the Lord's Prayer together before I go? I asked her. Let's do, she exclaimed. Suddenly I made contact and together we prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Every Sunday in this church, we pray those very words, thy kingdom come. We are praying for a good dream given by God to become reality in our world today. Says who? Says the Lord. As that lady and I prayed those words in the hospital that day, I could envision a future for her far different from the reality of that hospital bed. And I hope to meet her and others like her someday in God's kingdom, healed, restored, and made new. Says who? Says the Lord. I know that it goes against conventional wisdom, but our tomorrows can be different from our yesterdays. Says who? Says the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, adjust our attitudes in this busy and fraught season of our lives. Grant that our waiting on you may not be from laziness of heart, or weariness of spirit, but renew our hope, we pray, as we open our hearts and our minds to your good dreams for us and the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen.